Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the eighth episode of Hawk Blogger Mornings. I'm Brian Emhauser. You can find me on Twitter at Hawk Blogger and find us on YouTube under Real Hawk Talk. It's the start of a new week, so I hope everybody has enjoyed the weekend. We'll talk about some of the sports comings and goings of the weekend and also enjoying the week ahead. We've got some good weather on tap. I certainly plan to try to get out myself after the show, after a workout, get out there and do a hike somewhere. We'll see where. I don't know if there's any hikers in the audience. Uh, If you have favorite hikes around the PNW that I should give a try to, let me know. I am kind of exploring all with my dog, Finn, and been hitting all sorts of peaks and having a lot of fun doing it. So whenever there's sun out, I am certainly trying to get out there and explore the Northwest uh, as I haven't been able to do as much while working as much as I have for the last 30 years. So uh, this week, we've got a lot coming for you. And so it's a great time to remind you, if you haven't already, give the show a like, click subscribe. We are growing and growing, which is great to see. Uh, Well past the 9,400 mark on subscribers, want to get up to 10K, and then go over and join on YouTube um, as a new member. In fact, I want to welcome uh, Caleb Epp, who just became a new YouTube member. Great to have you, Caleb. You should be able to join. uh, And I actually made the mistake of not including the link. Let me go ahead and find that link. I'm going to do it live, which probably will work out really poorly. But you know, that's just how I'm going to play it. So it is a great time to join because you will also get the opportunity to, um, you know, get an emblem on your uh, on your avatar on your uh, account. So we know when you are commenting, and we will try to reply, be a little bit closer to that than we will to other folks that are not members on the YouTube channel. Also is going to give us a chance to do some member only uh, live streams. And those are specifically for folks who are at the suite level. Um, We've got, I think, a handful of folks who have joined at the suite level and would love to add some more. And we'll schedule our first suite level only AMA. And here is the link to join, posting that in chat. Hopefully that wasn't too painful. And then I'm going to pin that to chat, which will also take a second and hopefully not cause all sorts of chaos. Um, So yeah, join up there. It should work on any platform, this link that I'm posting. And uh, lots of folks have already done it. So why not join them as well? Uh, in addition to that, patreon.com slash hawk blogger. Join there. Also, dozens and dozens of folks joining there. You get access to the Slack channel. You get access to all the audio versions of these of these podcasts. So when you're taking a hike, when you're around, you will be able to listen as well as just watching here. So uh, patreon.com slash hawk blogger. Absolutely would love your support there. And you heard some of the impact of your support, hopefully last night as we had, I think, a terrific episode with Rob Staten and Jeff Simmons. Jeff, with his debut of the new mic, I believe it was significantly better. When I was doing the audio last night, it sounded better, but would love to hear from all of you. If you noticed a difference and it was better for you, that's really what we're aiming for. That's the most important thing. So uh, coming off the weekend, I just want to give you a view of what's to come. So we had a bunch of guests last week. We're going to have more this week. We're going to have Kentley Platt on Wednesday morning, who will is the maker of the RAS uh, system for grading athletic ability in draft uh, prospects. Really looking forward to talking to Kent. That should be fun. Also have Brad, PFF Brad, uh, joining on Thursday morning. So we'll post those events. You'll be able to see when they will be coming soon. We also have Michael Sean Dugar, who will be joining the Real Hawk Talk crew Wednesday night at 6 p.m. So lots to look forward to there. We'll likely have some other guests, but also I like to leave some of these times for some of the deep dives that we started with last week. We did 
uh, defensive tackle. We did linebacker, but there's a lot of other positions. And frankly, we didn't even get to the, the bottom of where I wanted to get with those positions, especially defensive tackle. So we're going to have some free time to do that. And as we're getting more folks joining and tuning in, having some back and forth conversation, if people have questions, we can do it a little bit like call-in shows. So we'll likely be able to use chat. And then maybe at some point we'll figure out how to bring people aboard and actually uh, ask their questions live so we can hear voices. And, and that's always nice to do as well. So uh, let me wish good morning to Matt B, uh, a displaced Seahawks fan in Georgia. Love it. Welcome. And uh, thank you, Colin Ludstrom. Hawk blogger mornings are always the best mornings. Appreciate it. Well, as of now, they're every morning, every morning and through the draft, we're going to see how this goes and see how much folks like it, see how much I like it. So far, it's been a ton of fun. Although I was so amped after our show last night, I I just, I loved the draft that we ended up with, which is completely probably not realistic, but I loved it, uh, where we ended up with Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat, and we had folks, uh, I think Zach Zinter and, and Malik Mustafa. I mean, there was just a lot of things to like about that draft, and I loved the conversation with Rob Staten and, and Jeff Simmons, and I had trouble sleeping. I was just, I was amped up from, from that discussion, so over two hours, probably the longest podcast, conversational podcast we've done. Uh, I think it was two hours and 19 minutes. So be sure to check that out if you've missed it. Out of the weekend for Mariners fans, a little rough. Uh, they, they end up splitting the series but with Boston, which is fine. But when you have your your top four going as uh, on the pitching staff and your home, you kind of expect the Mariners to win the majority of those games even if the offense is scuffling and boy was the offense scuffling just it was a pretty disheartening opening series because it really looked like the team got worse on defense and at least as bad in terms of making contact at least as bad at hitting off speed pitches anything that spun as Ryan Divish wrote in the Seattle Times team struck out a ton and so that was that was disheartening. You know, I, I made a joke because I think it was Larry Stone. I think it was Larry Stone, uh, formerly of the Seattle Times, re retired now. Who tweeted at the end of spring training, the Mariners don't look now. Spring training doesn't mean anything, but they lead Major League Baseball in runs scored and runs allowed. And I quote tweeted it kind of tongue-in-cheek but kind of like yeah let's brace ourselves this is probably what's coming is incoming for april mariners will score the fewest runs and allow the fewest runs because that's what the mariners do that's what the mariners do especially in april and sure enough that is how things started this weekend that was disappointing and if i want to say anything was a little bit encouraging you know, there was a couple late game at bats by Julio Rodriguez where he did not chase and he forced the pitcher to come to him and he either walked or he had the game winning hit uh, on Saturday. So that's at least a little bit encouraging, but by and large, it was not a good weekend for the Mariners. A worse weekend for the Astros who start off 0 and 4 lose they get swept at home by the Yankees that certainly would be worse and uh, from what I saw that was the worst start to a season for the Astros the first time they've been swept in a four-game series to start a year since 1978 so that is uh that's rough that's rough for the Astros and I know we all really feel for the Astros such a tough tough thing for them so we'll we'll see what comes up. The Mariners got their next series starting tonight. We get to see uh, get to see new pitcher Emerson Hancock, uh, who got a few starts last year before getting injured, and now he'll be back to start tonight. Hopefully, he uh, he shows out and has a good outing, and, and maybe the bats will come to life. Boston certainly pitched better than I expected them to. So. That is the Mariners. And then if you haven't already noticed, uh, I mean, 
I don't know where people are in the final four and where people are on March Madness in general, but I have to say I, I am most interested in this Purdue, excuse me, this Iowa LSU game in women's college basketball tonight at 430. I am not someone who's just saying that because I'm trying I have some agenda. There's genuine issues between those two teams. I absolutely am going to be tuning in at 430 today to watch Angel Reese go up against Caitlin Clark. I think it's going to be a memorable rematch. I have to also admit, I tuned in to watch Caitlin Clark a couple times so far in this tournament. It's been kind of boring. So, I mean, I'm not going to lie and say women's college basketball all of a sudden is must-see TV. This game, though, I think is. <laughs> I think it's got more interesting storylines than any of the men's college basketball games, although those games will potentially be more entertaining. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, thank you from DMW who says, Hey Brian, I love the everyday shows. It's needed for my Hawk therapy. Also try trading Arizona or Carolina, their first two picks for mock draft trade downs. All right. Appreciate the input. Speaking of the Hawks, I know that's why everyone's here. So let's get to it. I've teased it in the YouTube description and the thumbnail on Twitter. What are we going to do this morning? Well, First thing we're going to do is get to the level of depth that you're not going to get to on other shows. You're not going to get this on sports radio because sports radio has 24 minutes at the top of the hour before they go to break for 15 minutes or whatever it is. And then they come back at half past the hour for a few minutes and they basically are filling time with chat and then they're going to have another break. And then they come back at six four, you know, 44 past the hour and then 50 past the hour. Like it's all broken up. It's a lot of it's just fluff. And while I enjoy it and I tune into some of the podcasts because there's some interviews I like to hear and some, I think, worthwhile conversations, it's very superficial. So you're here because you are a obsessed Seahawks fan and want to get insights that you won't get other places and you want to hear things that you won't hear other places. Hopefully I can provide some of that. Today, what we're going to do, I have cataloged every single John Schneider draft pick since 2010, since he took over with the Seahawks, every position, every round, every player, and broken it out to be able to give you insights. And me, I'm, I'm revisiting this. I just updated this last night with last year's draft picks to see what, what positions does he pick and when does he pick them? And what do we think of those selections were really John Schneider's tendencies and which might have been influenced by Pete Carroll. Where do we think this is going to change? Um, so I want to start with just some raw numbers for you. So how many picks has John Schneider made in his 14-year career? So as a GM for the Seahawks. Any guesses, anyone have this in the top of their minds, uh, any guesses of how many picks John Schneider has made in his career since, with the Seahawks since 2010, okay? This is total number of draft picks. The total number of draft picks, I'll give you a little hint. It's more than 100. It's less than 150. The actual number is 127. So he has made 127 picks in the draft during this time. This does not include undrafted free agents. So I did not go into undrafted free agents. I think that's a different ball of wax. So we were not going to get into that. Of those 127 picks... Which positions do you think John Schneider has drafted the most? What is the number one position drafted by John Schneider? Picked 17 times. 17 times. And I'm going to do some quick math on the fly here. Um...
John Schneider has picked, let me make sure I've got this right. Yeah, 13.4% of his picks, almost, you know, a sixth of his picks, whatever it is, have been made at wide receiver. Wide receiver is the number one position selected by John Schneider. Why does that matter? Well, that's a lot of wide receivers, folks. And that's a significant chunk of his selections. And this is a massively talented wide receiver draft. What have we talked about in some of the mocks that we've done? Especially, I think I've brought up. People say, why are you drafting a receiver in the third round? Or maybe even the second round. And I tell them Tyler Lockett's retired, like likely gone next year. And this is a great class. And John Schneider values that position. I think this is a John Schneider tendency. I don't think this is Pete Carroll. I think this has nothing to do with Pete Carroll. I think we will see this trend continue. We may not see it this year, but I think it's going to be tough for John Schneider not to take wide receiver. One of the other things to be aware of is, where was John Schneider coming from before he came to the Seahawks? It was Green Bay. And what did Green Bay do remarkably well back when John Schneider was with them? They drafted receivers, often in the second or third round, and found success. I'll give you some examples. 2008, they drafted Jordy Nelson. In the second round, 36 overall. That worked out pretty well for them. They drafted in 2007, James Jones in the third round, 78th overall. That also worked out pretty well from them for them. 2006, they drafted Greg Jennings in the second round, 52nd overall. That, again, worked out pretty well for them. Between those three players, I see... There's others in there, but John Schneider really values the receiver position. And in a draft where there are maybe historically good depth of really high quality receivers, and you've got one of your best almost certainly gone next year. Is John Schneider going to be able to resist taking a receiver early in the draft that he has? Maybe he has a high second round grade or maybe a close to first and he's sitting there waiting for him. Is he going to be able to resist doing that? I don't know. He has not done a great job of resisting that in the past. And look, the wide receiver room is pretty darn strong. He hit on Tyler Lockett. If you want to know who the receivers are that John Schneider's hit, picked, let's go through those. We won't do this with probably every single position, but I'm going to just name them off. And then we're going to talk about what's his hit rate on receiver. Okay. So you'll, this is, I don't know if this is exactly an order. This is an order of round picked. Okay. So the only first round receiver he's ever selected was Jackson Smith and Jigba last year. That was the first time as much as John Schneider loves receivers. He has never picked one in the first round until last year with Jackson Smith and Jigba. Before that, Dwayne Eskridge, D. Eskridge, D.K. Metcalf, Paul Richardson, Golden Tate, all second round picks. Amara Darbo, Tyler Lockett, third round picks. Gary Jennings Jr., Kevin Norwood, Chris Harper, Chris Durham, all fourth round picks. Freddie Swain, sixth round pick. Bo Melton, Derek Young, John Ursua, David Moore, Kenny Lawler, all seventh round picks. So I think if you look at this and you say you're a Seahawks fan, you'd say JSN, I'm ready to say he's a hit. He's going to be fine. Um, he had one of the best rookie receiving seasons in Seahawks history, even if it wasn't as, as glossy and glitzy as we all hoped it would be. I, I think he's a hit. D. Eskridge, not. D.K. Metcalf is. Paul Richardson, I'd say 
is Paul Richardson was good enough to get a second contract, um, decent player. I don't think he was the, you know, blue chip hit, but he was a hit. Golden Tate hit. So of the guys drafted in the first or second round, I would say John Schneider has hit on four out of five. 80% of those guys have turned into good players. I see people asking about Jake Bobo. Jake Bobo was an undrafted free agent. He was not drafted by the Seahawks. Um, so that's pretty good. Now let's get into the third round. Amara Darbo, Tyler Lockett. Well, Tyler Lockett hit. Darbo certainly did not. So you're you're 50% there. But now you're starting to come down a little bit. So even if you talk the top three rounds, you're talking five out of seven players that became good NFL starters. The only guys in the top three rounds that they selected, that Schneider selected, that didn't work out have been D. Eskridge and Amara Darbo. Now let's take rounds four through seven. Gary Jennings, Kevin Norwood, Chris Harper, Chris Durham, Freddie Swain, Bo Melton, Derek Young, John Arsua, David Moore, Kenny Lawler. I would say none of those guys hit. David Moore had years, some years and games as a starter. He's still in the league. Bo Melton actually had a decent year for the Packers last year. I don't think he would say he's hit yet. None of those other guys really did anything of note. Freddie Swain certainly had some snaps, but I wouldn't say that he he was a player that you you want on your team and you're excited to have. So essentially the, the story is after round four, fourth round and on, John Schneider's not found a receiver. He spent a ton of picks on receivers after the fourth round. That is 10 picks, 10 picks on receiver after the fourth round. So maybe the lesson here is while John Schneider tries to find a diamond in the rough at receiver later in the draft, hasn't worked out for him. Maybe Bo Melton will turn out to be the guy that bucks that trend maybe you say david moore is the guy that bucks that trend david moore is a guy i certainly was high on at one point i i just don't think that there's a lot of return on investment we're going to look at other fourth through seventh round positions and see if he's had any more luck at other positions because it's also the nature of the draft fourth through seventh rounds is just something something that you're going to have more of a gamble on he has had more luck with undrafted free agent receivers than he's had in rounds four through seven. Without looking through all of them, I could just name off the top of my head, Doug Baldwin, undrafted free agent. Jermaine Curse, undrafted free agent. Uh, someone brought up Jake Bobo, undrafted free agent. So it's almost, <laughs> it's almost like wait till you get to the UDFAs and spend your, spend your time there. So wide receiver is the number one position group drafted by John Schneider 17 times out of his 127 draft picks. He averages drafting them in round, right around round four. 4.1 is the average there. And let's look at what would be the number two position drafted by John Schneider. There is a tie for second ranked position. And this one's a little bit, I'm going to give the tiebreaker to one of these two positions because the other one, it gets a little bit of a gray area, what you call, if, 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 if now there's multiple different players that could fit this description. So I'll give you a second. Wide receivers number one with 17 players drafted. What is the number two position drafted by John Schneider? The clue I'm going to give you is it's related to number one. What do you think is the number two ranked position drafted by John Schneider? All right. Time is up. Two, the second ranked position drafted by John Schneider is... Cornerback, cornerback drafted 16 times. Almost 13% of John Schneider's draft picks have been cornerbacks. Now, 
Why is that worth noting? For one, there you could make some indication that John Schneider values wide receivers. We just talked about that. And if he values wide receivers, he'd value the people that are meant to combat wide receivers. There's some symmetry to that. And you see that with the reason left tackles or tackle offensive tackles are paid really well. And then edge rushers are paid really well. They're opposing each other and you need good ones on each side to battle the other. So you could say the same for cornerback. I think from a positional value perspective, if you want to look at, um, let's look at franchise tag numbers by position. Um, make sure I've got this right. So, 2024, um, they don't have this ranked in order. Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, according to overthecap.com, wide receiver is the fourth ranked position by franchise tag. So that's a good indicator of market value. Cornerback, interestingly, is seventh. So it's down quite a ways, just above safety. Um, but relatively far down the list that can have some impact on positional value. And one of the things people, I think the, the casual fan doesn't understand about the draft and how front offices approach it is they are looking to maximize the value of the contracts. You want to draft a player earlier who's at a position that costs a lot of money. That's why one of the reasons quarterbacks are so bad. It's not just because they're valuable as a player or as a position on the field, but because what the market values them and what the market pays them. What do draft picks mean for a team? They mean, I hate to say it, but they mean cheap labor. So you want, as a team, to have the most talented guys at the most expensive positions in a cost-controlled contract to start their careers. So that's going to push up positions that are higher in the market salary uh, levels because you want to get a better deal. That is why there's controversy about tight ends going in the first round. You know, tight ends are not one of the top paid positions. They, in fact, they're third to last in position groups in terms of franchise tags, um, well off what everyone else is getting paid. Um, so that's that factors in. But for John Schneider, I think there's another factor here, and this is one that I will say I do believe was influenced by Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll was a safety as a player back when he played at Pacific or tried to play. He was a secondary coach. I think he always was somebody who loved those positions. And I think he saw the position more clearly than <clears throat> other coaches and so John Schneider was wise to take advantage of an advantage his coach provided. So I would bet cornerback is not going to continue to be as commonly drafted as it was when Pete Carroll was here. Who knows? Maybe Mike McDonald and his crew will take a lot of corners. If I look, I'm going to do a quick look here on Ravens draft history. I would say under the years that Mike McDonald has been defensive coordinator, they drafted one, two, three corners. None of them earlier than the fifth round. Caillou Blue Kelly, who was a Seahawk for a brief time. Uh, Demarion Williams in the, in the fourth round. Sorry, he was drafted in the fourth round. So someone was, the earliest was fourth round. <clears throat> and then Sean Wade was a fifth round pick. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm wrong. Brandon Stevens was a third round pick. Apologies, folks. Reading and talking is not maybe my best strength. So third round is a reasonably high pick to spend on a third round uh, to spend on a corner. So they have drafted a corner kind of each year um, <clears throat> with, uh, with Mike McDonald in tow. 
getting back to it with John Schneider, here are the cornerbacks that he has drafted. You've got Devin Witherspoon, Shaquille Griffin, Kobe Bryant, Trey Brown, Ugo Amadi, Walter Thurmond, Tariq Woolen, Trey Flowers, Ty Smith, Therald Simon, Richard Sherman, Michael Tyson, Eric Pinkins, Jeremy Lane, Byron Maxwell, and Ryan Murphy. I will acknowledge Mike Tyson, who was drafted in the sixth round by the Seahawks, was drafted essentially to be a safety, although he played corner in college. I had to categorize the, these guys in different ways. I could have moved him to safety. I kept him as corner because he did try at both positions. Um, you know, he didn't stick, so it doesn't really matter. But I, I'm going to acknowledge where I can, where there's some some gray area. I think the hit rate's pretty darn good on that. And what we'll do as we go through this, you'll see that the hit rate there stays stronger later. Okay, so Devin Witherspoon hit. Shaquille Griffin, third round. I think you got a call to hit. I don't like Shaquille Griffin as a player, but this was a guy that certainly netted a very large second contract with Jacksonville, who we all agreed was not smart to do it, but has been a starting corner in the league for a long time. So at third rounder, that's a hit. Kobe Bryant, fourth round, jury's out. First year looked like it might have been a hit. Last year certainly was not. We'll see. Trey Brown, fourth rounder, absolutely a hit. Fourth rounder, they've gotten, I think, better cornerback play than they got from Shaquille Griffin out of Trey Brown. Ugo Amadi, fourth round. He had one strong season as a starter. I, It's a borderline at a fourth round pick to decide whether that's a hit. I mean, to get a year as a starter from a guy, um, and he was also a very good special teams player, it's borderline. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sneer at you if you said that was a hit. Walter Thurman, fourth round, absolutely a hit. Tariq Woolen, fifth round, hit. Trey Flowers, fifth round. We all don't like Trey Flowers. I think he started not only for the Seahawks, but he played some years with the Bengals. I'm not sure what's going on with him now, but for a fifth round pick that's close to at least being a borderline hit, most fifth rounders never play. Ty Smith did not hit. Um, Therald Simon did not. He was borderline at fifth rounder, and I, I think Therald Simon was a little unjustly criticized. I think he had the potential to be a very good corner. Definitely had a rough Super Bowl. Um, Richard Sherman. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that was a hit in the fifth round. Mike Tyson, not. Eric Pinkins, not. Also someone who played some safety. Jeremy Lane in the sixth round, hit. Byron Maxwell, sixth round, hit. Ryan Murphy, not. So as you can see with cornerback, the Seahawks were able to get quality throughout the draft. Very different than the wide receiver position that we just went through. So I look at that and say, that's good. That could be good. I also say, I think scheme and coaching was a big part of identifying some of those players. Pete Carroll absolutely was a big reason Richard Sherman was drafted when he was drafted. And he's a big reason why he succeeded. So I, I think that corner is one to watch. It happens to be a also a, probably the strongest position group on this team right now. So I'm not sure, not sure I'm convinced that they're going to draft another corner anytime soon that might be a year or two before they do that again but we'll see there's there's it's a very strong cornerback draft they might be looking at guys like trey brown and coming up on his rookie year deal fin finishing and maybe they are looking again I, I don't know but i think that they probably pass there the next most commonly drafted position, and I'm. it is the same number. It's 16. They've drafted as, as many times, but it is a position that is a little bit more gray depending on what scheme you're playing. This position is defensive end, okay? So just like cornerback, it has been drafted 16 times. So these are the three biggest focuses for John Schneider in the draft, 17 wide receivers, 16 cornerbacks, 16 defensive ends. And I think as you'll see, most of these def defensive ends are edges. 
their edge rushers. There's a few that were a little bit borderline. We'll talk about those. But again, after the 16, like these two guys, these two positions that are 16, the next most drafted position is 12. So there's a pretty meaningful drop after this. And if you look at defensive end for John Schneider in his drafts, here are the names. Here are the names. LJ Collier, Bruce Irvin, Derek Hall, Boye Mafe, Daryl Taylor, Frank Clark, Cassius Marsh, EJ Wilson, Mike Morris, Tyreek Smith, Alton Robinson, Jacob Martin, Obam Guancham, remember him, Ty Powell, Greg Scruggs, and Dexter Davis. I was big on Dexter Davis when he was drafted in 2010. I want to welcome J.H. Wick as a new member on YouTube. He likely clicked the link that is in chat and joined. It is easy to do. It's accessible, I believe, from any device. And you get instant access as a YouTube member. You will immediately get an emblem. You can even see it on the podcast here. I get a little marker that someone is a member. And I know to look out for those comments and questions, pay a little bit more attention, try to answer them. As we grow and grow and have dozens and hopefully hundreds and maybe thousands of members over time, I won't be able to answer every question, but I will do my best to pay attention certainly to folks that are doing that. And hopefully the other thing that will happen is the community starts to grow and the community starts to talk to each other more. And I want to create opportunities for that to happen because it's not easy to meet folks wherever you are. And I think especially as guys, it's not that easy to do it. So one of the things that's great to do is find something you love and find some other people that love it and share it with them. So hopefully I've seen that happen over on the Slack channel, which is great. That is available for Patreon members. So patreon.com slash hawkblogger. You can join up there, get immediate access to Slack channel. Tons and tons of great conversation going there. Not just about the Seahawks. There are Mariners channels. There's Kraken channels. There are all sorts of things going on. So feel free to join over there. And you get access to all the audio versions of this podcast. Only Patreon members get that. And we will also be doing AMAs for some of the patron members as well. <clears throat> so patreon.com slash hawkblogger. And welcome again to J.H. Wick as a YouTube member. All right. So I was saying defensive ends. You can hear in that list why it's a bit of a mixed bag, right? LJ Collier is not Bruce Irvin. They play different positions. In a 3-4, LJ Collier is a defensive end. In a 4-3, sorry, in a, yeah, either way, a 4-3, he's a defensive end. Bruce Irvin is, he's like, a, he was a Sam linebacker. And he also, though, was drafted to be a defensive end. And in a 3-4, he would be a outside linebacker. So, I, you know, I could say Bruce Irvin spent most of his career as a linebacker and that's how he should be picked, but he started his rookie year. He was a defensive end and he was like a Leo. He was a pass rusher. Like Chris Clemens was what he was drafted to be. Boye Mafe, you know, he's, he's clearly an outside linebacker. He's like a Bruce Irvin in that regard. Derek Hall's the same way. Daryl Taylor's the same way. Frank Clark is the same way. Um, Cassius Marsh little different. He's more like LJ Collier, EJ Wilson, similar, a little heavier. Mike Morris. Mike Morris is 300 pounds. He is a 3-4 defensive end, but he is not an edge rusher. So that's why this position's a little bit mixed and, it, you know, we'll just deal with it. But that's why I'd say cornerback is the clear number two most drafted position. And I'd say defensive end is three because these aren't all the same position, so to speak which makes it a little harder to, 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 to grade. I want to men welcome Devo Martzal. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Welcome as another YouTube member. This is fantastic. Love having people join. So on the defensive end side, let's go through really quickly with rounds of those picks. So LJ Collier and Bruce Irvin were first round picks. Derek Hall, Boye Mafe, Daryl Taylor, Frank Clark, all second round picks. So six 
of the 16, pretty large number, were drafted in the first two rounds. Compare that to cornerback, where only one of the 16 was drafted in the first two rounds. Devin Witherspoon was the first cornerback the Seahawks took before the third round. In fact, they've only taken two cornerbacks before the fourth round. 16 players drafted at cornerback, only two drafted before the fourth round. So very different draft strategy with defensive end where you've got six guys drafted in the first two rounds. And including in each of the last two years, John Schneider has taken an edge rusher in Boye Mafe and Derek Hall. I'll take a quick question here from Matt B., uh, a member who says, with as much as McDonald wants players who are good in multiple facets, will they be as concerned with specific position assignments? I think that the multiple facets means more for certain position groups. So I think linebacker, safety, slot corner, those are going to be positions where they're going to want to have a little bit more interchangeability. And when he's talking about that, he's talking about which coverages, who they can cover, whether they can blitz, um, that kind of thing. Closer to the line of scrimmage, I don't think there's going to be as much you know, hybrid mentality there. I think though it will be in terms of whether you're rushing the passer or not. But I still think a defensive end and defensive tackle are going to do what defensive ends and defensive tackles do for the most part. So I, I don't think it's as big of a issue for for these kinds of players that we're talking about right now, but will be for for probably linebackers and, and safeties and, and, and alike. So again, six players drafted in the first two rounds at defensive end. And then Cassius Marsh, EJ Wilson were drafted in the fourth round, and then everybody else is fifth round and later. So Mike Morris, Tyreek Smith, Alton Robinson, Jacob Martin, Obam Guancham, Ty Powell, Greg Scruggs, Dexter Davis. And of those guys drafted at in like fourth round or later, Cassius Marsh was a valuable player. I think he's a he's a some measure of a hit in the fourth round. Mike Morris. Well, you know, the jury's out. Hopefully he's a hit, but I, I'm optimistic he can play well, but I'm not sure if he's as much of a fit for Mike McDonald. We'll see. Tyreek Smith, no. Alton Robinson, weird dude. Seemed like a hit and then just turned into nothing. Jacob Martin, in the sixth round, Jacob Martin's a hit to me. He, for that value, he's been a, a valuable rotational pass rusher. Obum Guancham, no. And I think they actually turned him into a tight end at some point. Ty Powell, no. Greg Scruggs, yes. Seventh rounder, he was absolutely a hit as a seventh rounder. And he played a little defensive tackle as well. So I think as far as the hit rate goes, not been so great. I mean, really, like, what's, what's the pro bowler? Who's the pro bowler that's come out of John Schneider's defensive end room. None of these guys. Bruce Irvin was never a Pro Bowl level edge rusher. Boye Mafe seems like he could be. Uh, Frank Clark. Sorry, I'm mistaken. Frank Clark certainly was a hit. So Frank Clark is the one guy out of these 16 that I think is a legitimate or was a legitimate top tier edge player and netted you a ton in return when you traded him. So very valuable player. He stands out as a second round pick. I don't know. I think the hit rates really low here and pretty dang concerning edge rusher is one of the most valuable positions in the NFL. Linebacker is the second ranked franchise tag position at 24 million. And that is because outside linebackers, these edge rushers count as linebackers. So that's pushing up that quite a bit. And for you to have this poor of a track record for finding edge rushers is concerning. Could that be coaching? Could that be that the coaching staff did not help identify the traits they're looking for in edge rushers? Possibly, but I'm, my instinct is this is a scouting issue 
And so that's a concern, but it's also an indication. This is why when you hear me talking about mock drafts, that John Schneider is going to be someone who will consider drafting a defensive end, even though we just drafted one in each of the last two years. It's because of the positional value, and it's because John Schneider's done it time and time and time again. So that's part of where I would just keep an eye on defensive end, even if it's not th the clearest need. I see a question here, someone asking, how do you define hits and misses? I'm not going into really great detail on that here. This is more of a conversational pass through. I would just say, where are you getting right now? I'm saying, where did you get good value for the player you drafted? And so I am defining a hit in the sixth round is different than a hit in the second round. Um, Greg Scruggs in the seventh round was significantly outperformed the value of a six, seventh round pick. Uh, Frank Clark outperformed the value of a second round pick. He was a first round pick value, what you got from him. Um, most of the rest of these guys, like Bruce Irvin, he didn't give you first round pick value. He, he, I love Bruce Irvin. I think he's been a very good player, but he's just always been a quality starter. He has never been a difference making player. And that's what you're looking for in a first round pick. So I don't, think that Bruce Irvin qualifies to me as, you know, really meriting first round pick value, but he's at least, he was a, a quality starter. So that's some, some level of value return for sure for that pick. Um, all right. So let's keep continuing. And by the way, like I said, average round of draft pick for wide receivers is around the fourth round. Similarly for defensive end and cornerbacks is around the fifth round, right? So it's, it's just a later, later pick. So the next most drafted position, it, we're going to go, we're going to go again. There's a tie between two positions and I'm going to break that tie based off the fact one is more clear cut than the other. The second most, oh, sorry, the second most. The fourth most drafted position by John Schneider 12 times out of his 127 picks is running back. Running back. So John Schneider has drafted 12 running backs in his time as a GM for the Seahawks. He has spent a first round pick on Rashad Penny. Three second round picks on Zach Charbonnet, Kenneth Walker III, and Kristen Michael. A third round pick on CJ Proceis. A fourth round pick on DJ Dallas and Robert Turbin. Fifth round pick on Alex Collins. Sixth round pick on Travis Homer. Seventh round pick on Kenny McIntosh, Chris Carson, and Kiero Small. So... I think the hit rate's pretty decent here. You've gotten, you know, very good. You had a lot of injury issues with some of these guys. Rashad Penny, certainly for the season when he was on the field, he was one of the most explosive running backs that has played in the NFL in a long time. That's not hyperbolic. That is true. This guy was averaging six yards a carry. He had more. 30 yard plus runs than any running back as a percentage of his care. Like he was doing crazy things when he was on the field. He just couldn't stay on the field and Philadelphia chose not to play him last year. So who knows what his career is going to do the rest of the way. First round pick, you know, I don't think I'm biased. I don't think running backs are worth first round picks almost ever. Zach Charbonnet and Kenneth Walker back to back second round picks. I think both of them are going to be guys that you're, you think are quality running backs. Um, Kristen Michael was a guy who had some hits and misses. I don't know if he really earned the second round pick, but certainly was, uh, you know, a, an okay running back. CJ Procise flashed elite ability, but as we know, could never stay on the field. DJ Dallas and Robert Turbin, you got different types of value. DJ Dallas as kind of a rotational guy and a special teams guy provided some value. Robert Turbin was a, you know, your backup for Marshawn Lynch. 
I was never a big Robert Turbin fan as a running back, but he, you know, fourth round pick. I, I'm not going to cry about that. Alex Collins certainly outperformed his fifth round pick status. Travis Homer is a sixth round pick. Most of his value was as a special teams player. Kenny McIntosh, the jury's out. Chris Carson, absolute home run, seventh round pick. Kara Small, a miss. So you, you've gotten value out of almost every single one of these picks in some way. My biggest issue with running back and John Schneider is how highly these picks have been applied to running back. To have four picks, let's just say five picks in the third round or greater, four picks in the second round or greater spent on running back. That is, that is wild. I mean, you've had six second round picks or greater spent on defensive end. Uh, sorry, third round picks or later defensive end. You've got five on running backs. Running back is <clears throat> the second worst position, second least valued position in the NFL. The only position group that is valued lower than running backs is special teams, kickers, punters, long snappers. And the Seahawks have made a point to spend their most valuable draft capital on one of the least valuable positions on the field. Now, this is one where you have to hope Pete Carroll was putting his thumb on the scale and forcing John Schneider to do this. We know how much Pete Carroll valued that position. He believed that, you know, the circle of toughness, he believed that running back set the tone. And there was some reason to, you know, even Quandre Diggs recently came out and said, hey, we were not the same team after Chris Carson left, <clears throat> after he got injured. You absolutely can see how running back can help set the tone for a team. I don't think that means that you spend a first or second round pick. Chris Carson was a seventh round pick. Marshawn Lynch was acquired for like, a fourth and fifth round pick. Okay. He was drafted in the first round, but you still got him for that. So you can get difference making running backs that are physical running backs that are tone setters later in the draft. You don't need to spend that. And if you look at the Packers, let's just look at who the Packers drafted in the few years before John Schneider came to the Seahawks. In 2009, they drafted Quinn Johnson as a running back in the fifth round. 2008, they did not draft a running back. 2007, they did draft Brandon Jackson in the second round. And then Deshaun Wynn in the seventh round. 2006, they did not draft a running back. 2005, they did not draft a running back. 2004, they did not draft a running back. 2003, they did not draft a running back. So if you look at the, the tree that John Schneider came from and what kinds of players that scouting tree valued, running back wasn't one of them. So I think there's hope here. Also, if you look at now, they've got Zach Charbonnet and Kenneth Walker. They don't need to draft running backs. And they got Kenny McIntosh. They just don't need it. So I don't think we have to think about this for a little while. I think this position will not be drafted for a little while. I also think if John Schneider succeeds in this new role and sticks around, I think we will see a pretty big shift in how much draft capital is applied to this position. And I think that's good news for Seahawks fans and for, for just this, the quality of this roster to give you some idea. Yeah, never mind. It, it's not that interesting. I was going to look, but yeah, it's just not a, <laughs> not a good draft strategy. So also tied with running back, but again, we'll talk about that. There's different versions of defensive tackles is defensive tackle 12 times. John Schneider has spent a pick on defensive tackle. 
And this is again, we'll go through the names here. You've got Malik McDowell and Jaron Reed were both second round picks. Rasheem Green was Rasheem Green, Nazir Jones, and Jordan Hill were all third round picks. Cam Young and Jay Howard were fourth round picks. Jesse Williams, Quentin Jefferson, and Jimmy Staten were fifth round picks. Demarcus Christmas was a sixth round pick, and Pep Livingston was a seventh round pick. So what did you notice with defensive tackles? John Schneider has never, ever, as a Seahawks GM, drafted a defensive tackle in the first round. Ever. Defensive tackle is the third most valuable position based off of franchise tag tender and what the market rates for that position. And what has John Schneider done? He has never spent a first round pick on a defensive tackle. And if you say, well, he hasn't had the chance to, he has had the chance to, he has had the chance to, and he did not. This one is very blurry to see how much coaching influenced this. Did Pete Carroll not value defensive tackle. I think that there's a decent chance that Pete Carroll did not value defensive tackle as much as he valued edge rushing and that he wanted those speed rushers off the edge. One of his first acquisitions, Chris Clemens. Like, I think that they really, Bruce Irvin drafted early. I think there were some pretty darn good defensive tackles that they did not go after. I think that Mike McDonald, we've talked about it on this show. Mike McDonald is going to value defensive tackles differently than Pete Carroll. His defenses rely on defensive tackles being incredibly stout, excuse me, and productive. I think we're going to see a shift. I don't think he's necessarily going to value them more than edge rushers. I do think you're going to see more of an equal weighting between those positions, which is going to be a dramatic shift up in the, in the prioritization for Seattle based off draft history. Maybe John Schneider also doesn't value defensive tackles. We know he doesn't value the interior offensive line. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but we also know from his conversations that that's the case. Maybe also interior defensive line. He doesn't value. He's been able to get, you know, over the years, the 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 guys that he wants at those positions relatively cheap, right? Tony McDaniel, Colin Cole, uh, Ataba Rubin, you know, those kind of players that he can get cheap as veterans on the market, Al Woods. And so he just may not see this position as high value. And the, the reason I say that this is also a mixed position is a three tech defensive tackle like Rasheem Green is different Jordan Hill they're different than Cam Young who's like a nose tackle Jaron Reed who's more of a nose tackle now Jimmy Staten was intended to be kind of a nose tackle so there's a little bit of a mix here but I think it is absolutely abhorrent that the Seahawks have never spent a first round pick on a defensive tackle under John Schneider. I think it's an issue and they had a chance last year to do it. And they picked Evan Witherspoon and I'm happy that they did, but I just want to point out time and again, like they pass on defensive tackles early in the draft of the guys they picked. We'll never know with Malik McDowell, but certainly that didn't work out. One of the, maybe the most costly mistake in John Schneider's career was drafting. It was trading back all those times and then taking Malik McDowell with that pick one pick before Buda Baker, you know, a lot of other guys that the Seahawks could have had with that pick before they traded down after they traded down, absolutely blew it. Jaron Reed in the second round, you certainly gotten value out of that pick. I'm I'm just not a huge Jaron Reed guy. I think he's very limited in his value. I think he is a slightly above average starter. So take that for what it's worth. 
Rasheem Green, very weird career. Looked like he was going to become something. Didn't really. Nazir Jones, similarly, flashed, you know, and then went away. Jordan Hill, I think that was very much a hit in third round. People forget about Jordan Hill. He was a big part of those Super Bowl teams, a great rotational pass rusher from the inside. I think it proved to be a very valuable player. Cam Young, jury's out. Jay Howard had some good years for the Chiefs, but did not make it in that stacked room back in the 2013 squad. Jesse Williams was excited about that pick, the Aussie, but never was able to get over the injuries. Quentin Jefferson in the fifth round, you definitely got more than fifth round value for Quentin Jefferson. He is just a rotational player, so not a star. Jimmy Staten, no. Demarcus Christmas, no. Pep Livingston, no. So not only has John Schneider not spent valuable draft capital on one of the most valuable positions, but he has not hit on most of these. So it's not great. Um, he has spent five picks above the third round, third round or above on this. He spent as many on running back. <laughs> so uh, this is probably, if you just swapped running back and defensive tackle, not even swapped, that's the wrong way to say it. But if you made defensive tackle a higher priority and you dropped running back, if you just made that change to Schneider's draft strategy, I believe that the Seahawks drafts will go significantly better than they've gone. So we're going to keep going here. I want to remind folks, give the show a like, click subscribe on the channel. Um, would love to see more subscribers trying to get up to 10,000. Uh, let's at least get up to 9,500. We should be able to do that quickly. 9,500 subscribers. How quickly can we get there and give the show a like would appreciate it. <clears throat> so what have we covered? We covered Number one position group that Schneider's drafted is wide receiver at 17. Number two is cornerback with 16. Three defensive end also with 16. Uh, a little bit of a split in terms of who qualifies as defensive end. That's why they get third. Fourth is running back with 12. Fifth is defensive tackle with 12. And again, a little bit of a mix. Nose tackles, three techs. That's why they get uh, uh, fifth instead of fourth with 12 and then the sixth most drafted position by John Schneider is any guesses the 11 times drafted offensive tackle offensive tackle is the Sixth most drafted position by John Schneider. 11 times he has picked offensive tackles. And this is an interesting one. He has spent four first round picks on offensive tackles. That is more than any other position. In fact, there is no other position that he has spent more than two first round picks on so you've got a guy here that loves and values his offensive tackles and for what it's worth you know offensive line gets all bulked together which i don't understand why franchise tag for that is down at the sixth most but if you look at left tackles, right tackles, they're getting paid significantly more than centers, for example. So you've got four first round picks and a second round pick and a third round pick. So that means six, six draft selections before the fourth round on offensive tackle. Who are these guys? Charles Cross, Jermaine Effetti, James Carpenter, Russell Okung, all first round picks. Justin Britt, second round pick. Abe Lucas, third round pick. Jamarco Jones, fifth round pick. Stone Forsyth, 
Justin Sr. and Garrett Scott, all sixth round picks. Michael Bowie, seventh round pick. I look at those guys. And first, let me let me clarify because there's people that I think get this wrong all the time. They're like, wait a second, Jermaine Effetti was a guard. Well, he was drafted to be a right tackle. He played guard in his rookie year, but he was always drafted to be right tackle, and that's where they played him. So he and he played tackle in college. So Jermaine Effetti was a tackle for me, clearly as a draft pick. James Carpenter started as a right tackle. He eventually moved to guard, but they wanted him as a right tackle. His coach, Nick Saban, I mean, when that came out, people were like, I don't know why they're going to try him at tackle. And I don't know why he's a first round pick, but good for him. And he washed out. So the fact that someone washes out at tackle and then becomes a guard does not mean that they were not a tackle in the scouts eyes. Justin Britt who ended up playing right tackle, guard, and center, was drafted at the start to be a right tackle, and he couldn't play the position, so he was moved elsewhere. So th this is a situation where people get this twisted and say, oh, they're, they're, they're drafting guards. No, they weren't drafting guards or centers. They were drafting tackles, often right tackles, who could not pass protect, and could not survive in the NFL on the edge. So they had to move them inside and protect them. And folks are talking about Ethan Posick. We'll get there in a second. Um, where is Ethan? Po oh, yeah. I have Ethan Posick as a center. We'll talk about that. But he played all five positions and was a guy that, that I qualified as a center because that was where John Schneider talked about him when they drafted him. They had an eye on that. So I, I give him credit for center, although he did get it tried at right tackle as well. So again, these are a little bit harder to categorize, but that's how I, I uh, categorize Posick. So, and I keep saying that, but I look at this position group and I say, all right, Charles Cross, jury's still out. I think he has not come close to measuring up to ninth overall pick value. He can still meet first round pick value if he becomes a plus left tackle. It's a valuable enough position. Right now, he is not. He's at best an average starter at left tackle. Jermaine Effetti, for me, was not worth a first round pick. James Carpenter was not worth a first round pick, although I think he provided more value and was a higher level player than Jermaine Effetti. I think he was a pretty good guard and got a good second contract with the Jets because he had value as a guard. Russell Okung hit, earned his Pro Bowl level left tackle. He was uneven and had a lot of injury issues. But, you know, that was a... That was a really important position, and they got value out of it. Justin Britt, I don't think, earned second-round pick value, although he did have a Pro Bowl alternate season as a center. So you could consider that, you know, partial hit. Um, he has not had that great of a career since, but he's been a starter. Abe Lucas in the third round was a smashing success his first year. Last year was a zero. It's all going to come down to injuries with Abe Lucas. If he can be on the field, I think this guy is going to be maybe one of their best tackle picks. Certainly one of their best right tackle picks. Jamarco Jones in the fifth round gave them really good value for a fifth round pick. He is not a great player, but he definitely got snaps and was a rotational swing tackle. Stone Forsyth, six round pick. I think... I the beholder there, six round pick value. He, he certainly made the team. And so most six round picks don't, and he's gotten meaningful snaps. So probably you got to give them that a valuable pick, but not a guy that's got a lot of upside. Justin Sr., no. Garrett Scott, no. I believe he had a heart issue. Michael Bowie, he had some time as a additional tackle brought in. Uh, generally speaking, you know, probably more value than you expect from a seventh rounder. 
I think the important thing to understand with tackle is just, again, to hammer this point home, John Schneider has spent remarkably valuable draft capital on this position. Is there reason to think he'll do it again? Even though you've got Abe Lucas, even though they signed George Fant, even though you got Charles Cross, does he feel comfortable with their situation at tackle enough that he's not going to want to take one of the strongest position groups in this draft, one of the strongest tackle classes you're going to see, is he going to let that go? This is a question I have. I think there's definitely some, this is why I think there's some of the guys we talked about in the first round, whether it's Troy Fautanu, Graham Barton. These are guys that are potentially guards for you on the roster, but have tackle experience and that could be appealing. And so if, <laughs> depending on how things work out, this could be another year where Schneider spends a first round pick on a tackle. So if you're a Troy Fautanu guy, this is ammunition that John Schneider has no problem spending first round picks on that position. If he thinks that these guys are only guards, we'll get to that in a bit. That's different. And he does not value that position in the same way. Okay. So that is the sixth most drafted position. The seventh most drafted position by John Schneider drafted 10 times is guard. Big, big difference between where he selects his guards. First, let me read off the guards for you. Damian Lewis, Reese Odiambo, and John Moffitt were all third round picks. Anthony Bradford, Phil Haynes, Terry Poole, Mark Glowinski were all fourth round picks. Ryan Seymour, Jared Smith, and J.R. Sweezy were all seventh round picks. What do you notice? John Schneider has never spent a pick before the third round. Not a first round pick, not a second round pick on a guard ever. And you could even argue Riso Diambo got time at tackle, but he was drafted as a guard, and that's where they started trying to play him. The hit rate on guards is interesting, and I think kind of goes throughout the draft. So Damian Lewis, absolutely a hit as a third round pick. Is he a Pro Bowl level guard? No but he has been a starter to sometimes a plus starter at the guard position and got a really large second contract. When The reason I talk about these second contracts is when the market values you as a player enough to give you a multi-year big dollar deal, that means that you've established your value and that that pick matters. So I think it, more than just a team re-signing their player, that also is validation, but money talks. And so Damian Lewis certainly has been a hit as a third round pick. Riso Diambo, no, as a third round pick. John Moffitt had a promising start. Certainly did not have a promising end. So he's a little bit more borderline third round pick. I'd say mostly no in terms of getting your value back there. Anthony Bradford, interesting start to his career. We're going to have to see if he takes meaningful steps forward, right? Last year, he was one of the worst starting guards in the NFL. I think he can, he showed flashes as a rookie. So there's reason to believe he can take a big step forward, but jury's out on him. Phil Haynes is a fourth round pick. That's a hit for me. He, you got multiple starting years out of him and a lot of starting games for him. Uh, so that's decent value for fourth rounder. Terry Poole, no. Mark Lewinsky is a fourth rounder. Absolutely. Guys had a long career and was a mistake by the team. One of the few mistakes about who they've let go. Seymour, no. Jared Smith, no. J.R. Sweezy, absolutely. Hit at seventh round. You got a lot of value out of that. So you can kind of see there that it's littered throughout. You know, you've got fourth round pick hits. You've got a seventh round pick. You've got some third round picks. So I guess I look at this and it matches up with John Schneider's words where he said that he thinks the guard position is overdrafted and overpaid. What has he done? He has not spent high picks on this position. 
third round at best. And they're only three third round picks. Most of these guys are either fourth round picks or seventh round picks. So if you are thinking Graham Barton is your first rounder and that they're looking at him as, man, this could be the second coming of Steve Hutchinson. He, he could be just a fantastic guard. And maybe if that doesn't work, I can be a great center. That would have to be a huge change of John Schneider's tendencies to knowingly draft an interior offensive lineman in the first round. It would be a huge deviation. It doesn't mean he won't do it. He had never drafted a cornerback before the third round last year, and he used the fifth overall pick to take one last year, and that worked out. So he does change his tendencies, and we do have a new coaching staff, and maybe they get a word in. But I will say, John Schneider on his show last Friday made the point to say that the coaches don't really influence what round a player should be taken in. He said that. I think that this is putting two and two together. There's some reason to believe that guard is not going to be their target in the first round. I would also add into that Jim Nagy said he doesn't believe that's the position they're going to draft in the first round. All these folks mocking Troy Fautanu, Graham Barton, including me, to the Seahawks in the first round. Evidence says, history says, that is a silly, silly mock to put to John Schneider, that he will not spend that kind of draft capital on that position. Where it gets a little murky is the guy like Fautanu and Barton, for that matter, that have tackle grades. They can absolutely be starting tackles. If John Schneider is thinking about them as a tackle, then that could happen. And maybe then they become the next Jermaine Effetti or James Carpenter who gets moved into guard. That's where it's a little bit of a gray area. But if they're looking at it as a guard, evidence would say John Schneider is going to look in the third round or later to try to fill that gap, even with a starting position open. All right. So that's guard. Let's talk about, well, Matt B asked, is Schneider referring to guards who can only play guards? Play guard. I, I don't know. I mean, who knows what John Schneider is referring to? I'm taking out his word that interior offensive linemen, if he's thinking about them, he is not valuing them the same way. Next. Next most drafted position, the eighth most drafted position by John Schneider is linebacker. Linebacker. And this is also one that is a little bit mixed in what def is defined as a linebacker, but drafted nine times by John Schneider. Let's go through those linebackers. Jordan Brooks, the only first round pick at linebacker. Bobby Wagner, second round pick. Cody Barton, third round pick. Kevin Pierre Lewis and KJ Wright, fourth round picks. Ben Burkhurvin, Shaquem Griffin, and Corey Toomer, fifth round picks. Malcolm Smith, a seventh round pick. What do you see? What do you hear when you look at these players and this position? A lot of hits, a lot of really good players. Jordan Brooks just got a nice deal from, from Miami and is a borderline Pro Bowl level player. He has not made the Pro Bowl. I think he can, but has not been that player yet. It's debatable about first round pick value, but these are largely off ball linebackers. So it's hard to get that value, but I think Jordan Brooks is, is a hit. Bobby Wagner, Hall of Famer. Yeah, qualifies as a hit. Cody Barton, you got a year of him as a starter. He also signed multiple free agent deals. Now he only got valued at like a million dollars. Third round pick. I say no for that value, but it's close. 
And I'm not a Barton believer, as you all know. So, but third round pick, I, I think he didn't live up to what they wanted him to. He's a he's an NFL player, though. So he he's I think he's more if he had been a fourth round pick, that's probably where he more appropriately or fifth round pick would have been valued. Kevin Pierre Lewis, he's an interesting one. He had some decent time with the Seahawks and actually was traded to the Chiefs where they saw some value for him. I don't know that you really got enough out of him to, to call him one way or the other. KJ Wright is a fourth rounder. Yeah, that's a hit. Ben Burkirvan as a fifth. No, although injury, I think, is an issue there. I thought he had some promise. Shaquem Griffin, no, even though he was a decent special teams player. Corey Toomer, no, as a fifth round pick. But Malcolm Smith, Super Bowl MVP. Yeah, I think he did pretty well there. So, you know, you look at that and you got Brooks, Wagner, Wright, and Smith. So that's four out of the four out of the nine guys that are high quality players, high quality players, some of them hall of fame players, some of them super bowl MVPs. So one of the things that stands out for me with the linebacker position, and this is largely off ball linebackers is that John Schneider has picked some good ones, has picked some good ones and has maybe a good eye for this position. And that's promising given the state of the linebacker room for the Seahawks. It'll be really interesting to see if he values any of the off ball linebackers in this draft the way he did some of these other guys. And he hasn't had to go into the first two rounds always to find them. Although you would say his best two of his best three were drafted in the first two rounds. Jordan Brooks, Bobby Wagner were both first or second round picks. KJ Wright was a fourth round pick. So KJ Wright fourth, Malcolm Smith seventh. Those are both pretty valuable guys to get later. I don't know if you want to gamble on seventh round picks at this position, given the state of that position group for the Seahawks, but I think there's reason to be positive there. Good opportunity for me to welcome Matthew McGiveron as a new YouTube member. Love it. We are joining up at high rates. A bunch of folks have already joined today. I think that's four people that have joined. You two can join. The link is pinned in the chat. And you should be able to go to the Real Hawk Talk channel on either a desktop browser, your Android device, or just click the link in the YouTube chat. And you will be able to join up as well. As a YouTube member, thank you, Matthew, for joining. And <laughs> he says he chuckled at my control the zone stats of the Red Zone Red Sox series. Yes, the Mariners, uh, they controlled very little, and the zone was definitely not one of them in that series. I also would ask folks, give the show a like, click subscribe. I really want to keep growing the community. Could use your help to do it and go over to patreon.com slash Hawk blogger. Join now. You will not regret it. I think all the audio versions are going to be posted for these podcasts. And it's the best way, I think, to hear the show while you're on a walk, while you're in the car, all those things. You can get that through patreon.com slash Hawk blogger and get access to the Slack channel. All right. Um, so that's linebacker. This is a position that John Schneider takes at every round. He's taken, he's taken a linebacker in every round of the draft other than the sixth. So it doesn't clump. He kind of evenly spreads it across the draft. He's willing to spend early draft capital. If he sees a guy that has high potential. And when he's done that, <clears throat> he's been right. He's picked good guys. Jordan Brooks and Bobby Wagner are good players. He's also managed to find some value late. It's a good position. How much of that was Pete Carroll? I don't know. I don't know. Ken Norton Jr. was a coach under Pete Carroll, and I think is there's reason to believe that he could have helped there. I think Mike McDonald is a guy that knows linebackers really well. So I think there's a reason to think this will continue to be a good quality group for the Seahawks in their draft going forward. That was the eighth most selected position by John Schneider. We have four more to go. We're going to power through these. 
the ninth most selected position by John Schneider is safety. He has drafted eight safeties in his time as a Seahawks general manager. Those safeties are Earl Thomas in the first round, Marquise Blair in the second round, Lano Hill in the third round, Tedrick Thompson in the fourth round, Mark Legree and Cam Chancellor in the fifth round. One of those is not like the other. Jarek Reed and Winston Guy in the sixth round. Not a position that they've drafted very often. Clearly some of the best players that have ever put on a Seahawks uniform. Earl Thomas, Cam Chancellor. You know, Hall of Fame level players. Ring of Honor level players. They've also had some massive swings and misses. Marquise Blair in the second round, disaster. Lano Hill and Tedrick Thompson in the third and fourth round, disaster. Jarek Reed's a guy I'm interested in, really showed promise as a special teams player, was leading the NFL in special teams tackles before he was injured. He got a serious injury. He's going to be out maybe all the way up into this season. So I don't know that we'll see what he has to really offer this year as he recovers from that knee injury, but I think is an interesting player, especially in this more hybrid defense that Mike McDonald likes to play. But this has kind of been boom or bust. Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor, boom, literally pretty much everyone else bust. And as you heard, John Schneider's drafted this position all throughout the draft. Every single round, other than the seventh round, he's spent a, a pick but he just doesn't pick this position very often. Again, only eight times. Compare that to wide receiver where he's drafted 17. And I think part of that, though, to be to be clear, part of the reason he might not have been drafting at safety is because you had Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor for a lot of your time here. And you didn't need guys to replace him. And you had guys behind Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor rotating in. You had guys like... Uh, Ah, uh, man, it's driving me crazy. He starts with a J with the third safety. I'm looking him up right now because I can't stand this. Um, uh, Jerron Johnson. Is that him? I think I'm right. I think I'm right. Uh, but now I have to I have to double check. No, not Seahawks draft history. Gosh darn it. Um, okay. So <laughs> I know I'm right, but I played it, played it, I think, Boise State, I want to say. Um, Seahawks, how can I get to the franchise page? There we go. 2000, let's say like 2013 squad. Let's look at the roster. You guys are, I'm sure, already confirming this in chat, but I'm taking a look anyway. Uh... That Deshaun Shedd played a little bit of safety. Jerron Johnson, I nailed it. Boise State, that's right. Okay, let's go. Uh, so yeah, they had they had their safety position largely set, and they didn't need to draft replacements. And they also acknowledged that that was a bit of a mistake that John Schneider drafted for need too much, and they did not create competition. And they also, when they drafted guys, they'd come in and be like, "I'm not going to beat." Earl Thomas or Cam Chancellor for snaps. Why am I even here? So it was hard to find players that even wanted to compete with those guys for snaps. That could be part of the reason in the last few years. Let's take a look here. And I'm going to look if safety has changed. You know, in 2000, why is this not sorting right? Um, what's going on here? Okay. There we go. Good. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> I can't read my own, uh, research. So 2010, they drafted two, right? First round, fifth round, you get hall of fame <laughs> duo at safety. Pretty good start. 2011, they drafted one, 2012, they drafted one. And then they go five years before they draft another safety. From 2017 to 2023, they've drafted four. And they drafted one last year. Before that, it had been four years, 2019. So I was trying to see, 
have maybe since those guys have left, have they started spending more on that position? They haven't. Why? Because they had Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs, who they traded multiple first round picks for. So you have to look at that as another, you know, they spent a fifth round pick on Quandre Diggs. So they found safeties in other ways. And this just has not been a position where they've been looking to add people. I think it now qualifies as a position where they're going to look to add people. So I think safety is going to be a position where you're going to see a change in draft philosophy for the Seahawks. I think you're going to see safeties taken more often. They don't have enough control or elite players at that position right now. I think safety is going to be something that the Seahawks will draft a player this year. I think almost count on it that they will draft safety. It's not a strong safety class. Maybe it'll be an undrafted free agent, but they need to add young players to that mix. That is the ninth most drafted position as safety. The 10th most drafted position by John Schneider is tight end. 10th most drafted. Who are the tight ends that John Schneider has taken? Nick Vanette, third round. Colby Parkinson and Will Disley, fourth round. Luke Wilson, fifth round. Anthony McCoy, sixth round. Steven Sullivan and Jameson Kantz, seventh round. Not a position that he spent a lot on. Not a position that he values highly. Has never spent a first or second round pick on a tight end. If you are a Brock Bowers guy, I think you're barking up the wrong tree. I think there is a very small chance that John Schneider drafts Brock Bowers. I think there is a much larger chance that John Schneider trades back to someone who does want Brock Bowers than that he actually turns in the card and drafts him himself. So not a position John Schneider drafts very highly. When he does spend picks on it, he's done reasonably well. Nick Vanette, not a great third round pick. Obviously would have preferred George Kittle, who I believe was picked immediately before. <laughs> Let me double check that because I think that's what happened. Um, I was looking back here. Nick Vanette, third round, 94th overall pick. Can I get to that? There we go. See how good my... No, I'm not right. Um, when was I could have sworn? Oh, no, sorry, I'm thinking of the wrong year, so it wasn't Kittle. They took Nick Vanette, and there was another guy from Ohio State. Ah, doesn't matter. Um, they took Nick Vanette that year, and then Luke Wilson was drafted in the fifth round, that worked out pretty well. Dis Disley and Colby Parkinson in the fourth round certainly worked out pretty well. Um, definitely outplayed their value. Both got good, <laughs> very good second contracts. Anthony McCoy, definitely for a sixth round pick, highly valuable for that. Steven Sullivan, Jamison Khan, seventh round didn't work out. But basically, you know, almost every player that they've drafted above the seventh round has provided some value and worked out. Tight end is not a highly valued position in the market. It's not paid very well. Even with flashy players out there, I think that this is a position I expect John Schneider to stay exactly as he's done before. He'll draft a tight end in the fourth round or later. I don't think he will draft a tight end early. If there's someone you love early on, I don't think he's going to take Brock Bowers. I do think some of the guys we've been talking about in the fourth round or later, Tip Ryman, Theo Johnson. If Theo Johnson goes in the third round, I don't think you're going to see John Schneider take him. I think this is a position that the Seahawks will take this year, but will take later in the draft. Keep going. The 11th most drafted position, second to least most drafted position by John Schneider in his time here is center. Should come as no surprise, they've spent three draft picks on the center position. Ethan Posick in the second round, and then Joey Hunt and Christian Sokoli in the sixth round. So only one time have they spent a pick 
before the sixth round on a center. And it was a guy who plays multiple positions, including playing right tackle for them. So you could argue he doesn't even belong on this list. Maybe he wasn't the guy they thought of as a center, although I believe that is how they thought of him. That's how John Schneider talked about him. I think that's how the coaches talked about him initially. He just played other positions. That's what he played in college. I look at this and say, I mean, Posick has been playing reasonably well for Cleveland. It is a pretty sad list. Joey Hunt, little Joey Hunt. Six round. You got value for six rounder, so I'm not going to hate that. And by the way, why is Olu not showing up on my list? So this is something's wrong. Something's wrong. Hold on, folks. My, my, <laughs> my little macro didn't work on this one position. It's the only position so far. So why is that? Huh? Why is that? Oh, I see. Interesting. Wait a second. I don't know. Something's wrong, but I will bring it Olu into this. My fault. He is on my list, but for some reason did not get added to all of the pieces. So Olu was drafted in the fifth round, pick 154. I will manually add him for now. Fifth round center. Okay. So let's, well, I'll just leave it. Sorry. My, my uh, need for things to be perfect is, is affecting my ability to do commentary, but I'm done. So they spent four picks on this position. Um, only one of them before the fifth round. And that was Ethan Posick. Olu Olu with Timmy is now going to get a shot. Most likely to start this year. As a center, we don't know. Jury's out. My best guess with Olu, Olu with Timmy, is that he is going to be an Ethan Posick level center. Like, maybe a little bit better of a pass protector. He's got to improve his power. I don't think he's a, is as strong of a run blocker, even as Evan Brown was last year. And... Hopefully that's something he can work on, you know, around the, the clock, you know, around the calendar year with the NFL strength and conditioning. He needs to put on a little weight and I think he needs to add some power. I think he's smart, but we'll see. We'll see. And so centers a position where John Schneider has not, not spent draft capital. He has not spent money in free agency. He is, Famously let Creed Humphrey go to draft a wide receiver, which is his number one ranked position. That's just what it is. I think we'll see that continue. I don't see that necessarily changing. And we'll see if Scott Huff and Ryan Grubb, both offensive line backgrounds or current responsibilities, will ask John Schneider to spend a little bit more on that position, either with draft capital or with free agent money. So far, that has not proven true. Now we are down to it, folks, down to the quick. The least drafted position by John Schneider, and I'm not including special teams, the least drafted position by John Schneider is the most valuable position in the NFL quarterback. John Schneider has spent only two, two of his 127 picks on the quarterback position. That is one and a half percent. One and a half percent of his draft picks have been spent on the quarterback position. That almost by itself is a fireable offense. If he had not hit, on one of those two with a borderline hall of fame quarterback and Russell Wilson in the third round, this would mean everything else he's done is moot. This is something that I will continue to criticize loudly until it changes. The Seahawks should be drafting a quarterback every year. 
at least in bringing in undrafted guys, but I think they should be drafting a quarterback every year until they find their next franchise quarterback. It is not acceptable to go through a draft and just not have guys that if you're saying consistently guys are getting picked before you want to get them, understand that the league values this position more than you and that they're right to value this position more than you. So what do you got to do? You got to adjust and you've got to pick quarterbacks higher in the draft. That might mean you've got to spend a third round pick on a guy that you've got a fifth round grade on or a fourth round grade on. If you want to have a chance to find a quarterback, the fact that the league undervalued Russell Wilson and he fell into your lap doesn't mean that that's going to keep happening. It doesn't, that is not a strategy. The fact that Brock Purdy was Mr. Irrelevant and has been a very good quarterback for the 49ers is not a strategy. The fact that Tom Brady was a sixth round pick and is maybe the best quarterback to ever play is not a strategy. This position is too important to be playing roulette and just hoping that some highly valued guy falls to you and you get to say, ha, look how clever I am. They have got to be spending draft capital on this position. And look, they just did to some extent with Sam Howell. They traded what the equivalent of a fifth round pick for Sam Howell. I think in that case, I think he's more valuable than a fifth round pick. So I think that's a good deal. I still think they should be drafting a quarterback. I think that it most likely would be someone like a Jordan Travis later in the draft. But I still think that would be a wise thing to do. And I think that you cannot continue to say we have only drafted two quarterbacks in 15 years. You can't do that. You can't do it. That is every position group, every player other than punter and kicker that John Schneider has drafted in his whole history. 127 players. Sorry, 100. And... Let me double check something real quick. <laughs> A couple things are coming up. I want to double check. Uh, as far as I know, that's right. And John Schneider has drafted wide receivers the most, defensive ends and cornerbacks, then defensive tackles, then running backs, then offensive tackles, then guards, then linebackers, then safeties, then tight ends, then centers, then quarterbacks. Of the positions drafted in the first round, offensive tackles we talked about way more than anybody else. Four, four, First round picks on offensive tackles. The only other position where he's spent more than one first round pick is defensive end, edge rushers, with two. So if you're a betting man and you want to talk about what John Schneider is most likely to do in the first round, it's offensive tackle or defensive end. That's the odds on favorite. He has spent a first round pick on an off ball linebacker, he spent one on a safety, he spent one on a corner. He spent one on a wide receiver. He spent one on a running back. So those are other positions. He has never spent one on a guard, on a center, on a quarterback, on a tight end. And on a defensive tackle. That last one is the one I have my eyes on this year. Could this be the year, just like last year was the first time he'd spent a first-round pick on a cornerback and a first-round pick on a wide receiver. He never spent a first-round pick on either of those positions before last year. Is this the year that defensive tackle gets a first-round pick out of John Schneider? I think there's a decent chance. If I was a betting man right now, like re-familiarizing myself with his draft history knowing what I know, which is not a lot, but what I know about Mike McDonald and how he values the position and what I know about the, the prospects in this draft, I would bet defensive tackle may be the most likely first-round pick for John Schneider. It might depend on who falls to them at 16 and whether they trade down and whether the guys are still available for them. Quick pause here. Joshy Cashman, a member. 
the former cable thanos star himself says are these morning shows going to continue after the draft you know what folks that is a great question and it is going to be one that we can mutually answer so one is going to be do i enjoy this enough to continue doing it day after day so far i'm loving it i'm having a great time hopefully that's coming through but i'm enjoying spending my time doing this so i'm happy to do it we'll see how i feel in 30 days from now i want to do that more the other part of it is be totally transparent. There's got to be enough financial support to make it worthwhile. There's got to be enough support. And right now, all of that money is going to charity. So I'm not making any money from this. At some point, you know, I'm, I'm off work right now and, and step back from my job. There might be a conversation to be had. If, if like there's enough interest in this, if we can grow the memberships, then we can start talking about what this looks like as a long-term thing. But it depends. It depends. So I, for right now, what I want to do is just focus on having fun doing this and hopefully having you guys have fun doing this. And let's see how the memberships grow. Let's see how the community grows. Let's see how much fun we're having. Let's see how much money I can give to charity this year um, with all your support. And then let's figure out what goes on from there. But for now, going to have fun with it. So I guess the other piece here is we talked about this a little bit. What positions might change with John Schneider in terms of his valuation with the coaching change? How much did Pete Carroll, as the sole owner of personnel decisions, he is the prover, how much did that affect things? And how much did Pete Carroll's positional valuations or scheme change things with Mike McDonald coming in, who does not have final say on personnel and has different schemes that he and Ryan Grubb are running. What I think that's going to change, I think running back is the one that to me is the most obvious. I don't think we're going to see running back drafted almost ever anymore, and certainly not in the first few rounds. I think John Schneider's not going to do that, and thank God. I believe defensive tackle might be the one that changes most from there. Now, this is tough because John Schneider, I still believe, does not value interior defensive line the way Mike McDonald does and the way the rest of the league does. I think he believes he can get cheap value there. And he's had some success, but never finding like elite value um, off the scrap heap. So I think that's one that could change. Edge rushing. That has been the most prized with John Schneider, one of the most prized positions. I think it'll be less. I think it's going to even out with defensive tackle with Mike McDonald. So I think that's going to change. I believe safety will change. And I don't think this is necessarily a coaching thing, but I think because you had Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor, and then you had Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs, you just haven't had openings for young guys to come in and earn spots. That's not the case anymore. I think safety is going to be a position that they're going to look to add to. And I think safety is a crucial position for Mike McDonald. That will change. Linebacker may change depending on how much we'll, we'll see with Mike McDonald. I think that one's going to be more susceptible to what is the talent available in the draft. I don't know that they're going to overdraft that position, but we'll see. And then quarterback. I mean... That's got to change, right? Two guys out of all these picks. I, I just don't believe it. So that is the show breaking down all of John Schneider's draft tendencies. You will not find that anywhere else. And if you do, they stole it from me. I think there's a lot to learn there and a lot of conversation to have. Hopefully you tell other folks that you give this show a like, you subscribe to the channel, you join the YouTube channel as a member and join over at patreon.com slash Hawk blogger. Would love to have you. Would love to have more folks as part of the community. And until tomorrow, I say, have a great day. Oh, and look at that. What a wonderful timing. Jim South made just joined as a new member on YouTube. Thank you, Jim. And welcome. So tomorrow I will decide, I think we'll do a positional deep dive tomorrow. I haven't decided yet exactly what I want to do. Keep in mind Wednesday, we got a double dip in the morning. We've got 
Kent Lee Platt, who is the maker of the Raz athletic scoring system for draft prospects in Hawk Blogger Morning. And then in the evening, Michael Sean Dugar is joining the crew for Real Hawk Talk at 6 p.m. And then Thursday, we've got Brad from PFF joining. We can talk cap. We can talk draft. We can talk all sorts of things with him. Lots of good content coming. So see you all soon. Have a great rest of your day. Take care.